Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Christine Williams. And you are listening to Fiber Talk, that twice weekly podcast for people who play with needles, thread, canvas, ground cloth, wire, and there always should be something else, but I don't think what it is. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. yeah I don't know. Because you want to be like Chili Hollow and you're just not. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I'll never be a Jane Wood, that's for sure. Okay. No, no. So, all right. Well, anyway, we're, yeah, we're that podcast thing. And our guest this week is Diane Herman. Hi, Diane. Hi there. I first ran into you because I just love the design walking the water's edge. I mean, that's yes. a, lot of, a lot of people do. Yeah, that's a signature thing so right there. That's, that's a standout. So level two teacher certification from uh, National Academy of Needle Arts. Uh, you teach everywhere. I've, I've attended one of your lectures and one of your classes and former University of Chicago mathematics teacher. And then we have to explore this, how you work mathematics into needlework, because I just find that absolutely fascinating. And, That'd be uh, great to talk about. Yeah, good. Yep. And then... Yeah. Uh, and there's one piece in particular where it's obvious, I think. In your uh, list of teaching pieces, I, I thought one was a standout math piece, but <laughs> I might be just very nerdy. Well, what what, ner what nerdy piece are you talking about? Uh, I don't. I have to pull it up to see. Um, but it but it's a Moby strip. Oh yeah, yeah. We should talk about that too. Yeah, yeah. That's math. That's very math and very nerdy. It right. See, there you go. Right, right. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about right. it. I mean, it's on the table here. What? Yeah, because okay. I saw that. I did not know you had. I I'd not seen that till I looked at your website. Okay, so let me give you the background on that piece, and it might lead us into conversation about other kinds of things. So I have uh, done uh, cert teacher certification through the National Academy of Needle Arts, and that's a three-year program of in-person classes at certification workshop on site with your teachers and with fellow students. Plus, uh, in the years between in-person workshops, you have a list of assignments to complete, and part of the goal is to create a portfolio of needlework teaching pieces that spans a wide variety of possible students. So you want to make a beginner piece, you want to have a chapter piece, you want to create a lecture you might give to an interested group of needle artists, you create an advanced piece. And one of the things you do at the very end of your certification process is create what they call an expertise piece. And I wanted to put mathematics into my expertise piece. So I stitched a Mobius band. And for those needle artists who might not know what a Mobius band is, it's a one-sided surface. It's very easy to make, although describing it over an audio podcast is kind of challenging. Um, but it's a one-sided surface. And so if you're walking around on this one-sided surface, you walk around it and you think you'd cross the side, but you don't. It's just hard to explain, but you need to go look at this piece. And what I did with this particular piece is I stitched a 60-inch long piece of canvas, and I did a color wheel on it, going from the standard color wheel, red, orange, yellow, blue, violet, through those colors, green's in there somewhere. And I stitched, uh, the motifs were leaves, and I stitched uh, moving from, say, uh, orange, red, uh, to orange, to orange, yellow, to, to yellow. And I stitched leaves in those different colors using different varieties of threads. And then I assembled the band into a, a surface. And it, if you look at it on the one side, I said it only has one side, but if you look at it from one <laughs> angle, uh, you see the secondary colors and from a different angle, you see the primary colors. So it was a fun piece to create. And if you look also at that piece carefully along the edge of the piece, I've done a, a border in scotch stitch in a grayscale, which is another something yeah. that's got to do with color. So I call this piece a color wheel with a twist because to create this Mobius band out of this long 60 inch piece of, of canvas, what you do is you do four half twists and stitch it together. And then you sort of poof, magically assemble it into a Mobius band. And I got the idea from a book that was created from a mathematics special session at one of our professional meetings. Uh, mathematics and fiber arts is uh, something that's very common to talk about at our professional meetings. There are a lot of mathematicians who do fiber arts. And uh, there's a couple of volumes I've contributed to one of them. It's on my bio. But in the first volume, they did this Mobius band quilt. And I 
used that idea to make a Mobius band piece of needlework. And I miss the grayscale on the edge. Yeah. 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 And it really adds a, um, it adds dimension to it and it makes it um, much more of a sculptural piece, which I think is really interesting. Right. It is three dimensional. And the fun thing, the fun thing about exhibiting it when I, when I have it out for show, I have it on a mirror tile, a 12 inch mirror tile so that you can sort of see the both aspects of it at one time. The other Mm -hmm. thing I did, I also, I like to put stump work in my canvas pieces and each a set of colored leaves has one little stump work thing on it. So I use the idea of color complement so that on the green leaves, for example, where red is the complement, I made a red ladybug. And where there's a yellow leaf, I've got a, I've used purple to make, I think I made ants for that. So I made a color complement stump work or beaded bug to go on each of those leave sets so it's a fun piece and i've i've used it to teach a color class it's a it's a really fun i've never seen anybody else do the whole mobius band thing but when i've taught it lots of people get interested in taking a piece of ribbon and trying to do the mobius band creation for it it's fun there's your next project right there christine that's that's (laughs) i know i know you know knitters and crocheters make there are patterns for them to make mobius band scarves i've seen those out there yeah yeah this is just a way to do it yeah. Well, and what's cool about it is that sort of now you now that you have the idea of doing a Mobius band or strip, you can really do any kind of motif that way. You sure. know, because really you're just carrying something around the the strip. So you you could really just take that idea and take off with it. So sure. it's really interesting. And I I like the art of MC Escher and it's part of as yes. a mathematician I studied mm-hmm. a lot of Escher and his geometry. And uh, he does a lot of that. He has ants walking around on a Mobius band and some of his lithographs. So that kind of idea is very natural to pursue. It'd be a fun thing to do. I like it. So I'll tell you a, a funny nerdy story. So as long as we're talking about math, when I was in high school, in my high school calculus class, uh, for I guess it was maybe our final, we were given uh, permission to have one eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And we were allowed to write on one side of it and write whatever we wanted, you know, big, small, whatever, um, e- equations, hints, things, you know, a- anything we needed to carry into the test so that we could actually do uh, do the math instead of just doing the memorization part. And so all of us kind of being pain in the butts that we were, um, each of us wrote um, – it made a Mobius strip. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and and brought that in because then, um, because basically what you're doing is creating a strip and then putting it together like a loop, but you flip it one side so that you're really writing on both sides of the sheet of paper. Correct. So Correct. We, we managed to get double the amount of, of square inches um, on, on an eight and a half by 11 one-sided piece of paper. Very and clever, very be, clever, nerdy being, thing to do. Right, a math teacher just uh, kind of looked at us and said, all right, that fits the bill. I can't say anything. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, oh, absolutely. There was, you know, he, he, you know, if anything, it was praise for a clever solution, which yeah, I think math, is it. Yeah. The, the sign math of teachers a, really love having students go that, that direction with them. It's yeah. Really yeah. Because it meant that somebody actually paid attention and, and used the geometry that that we had been taught and so yeah so that was kind of fun so ever since then it's been sort of a funny little thing for cool. for me so the idea of doing that is is kind of appealing right geez you must be a riot at a party <laughs> right <laughs> you got to go to the right kind of party gear exactly <laughs> party of mathematicians i'm like the, a rock star seriously there you go. yeah see i'd be the i'd be the kid walking in with the one-sided sheet of sheet of paper and going oh man <laughs> missed opportunity yeah there you yes. go yeah uh i'm intrigued diane that so many math people do needlework i mean it makes sense but i'm intrigued that you would get together with with a bunch of math people especially at the level that you operated and find a bunch of needle workers Is oh that... there's it's it's a large group and it it is um surprisingly not exclusively female. There are a lot of male participants in the fiber group at, at our joint meetings. There we there's go. People, All right. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people who are interested in 
the notion of crocheting interesting surfaces i yes. there was popular mm -hmm. for a while the crocheted coral reef that went around and yes. there's hyperbolic yes. planes and mm -hmm. yeah the the two volumes that came out of those special sessions um crafting by concept and making mathematics with needlework are really wonderful um, books that were put together by the organizers of those special sessions, uh, Sarah Marie Del Castro and Carolyn Yackel, and they um, asked each of us who provided a chapter. Uh, we, we gave a talk at the meeting, but then the, each of us who provided the chapter for the subsequent book, we needed to talk about the mathematics, we needed to talk about the craft, and then we needed to provide a project for someone who was interested in pursuing that and there's all kinds of projects in there there's tamari balls and crocheted weird pants and there's cross stitch symmetries and there's i have a chapter on diaper pattern and needlework so it's really a it's a wonderful set of books for those of us who find that connection between um, dimension and symmetry and geometry and needlework to be uh, fascinating yeah, well, I got cool. you. Got to send me the links because I'll put those in the show notes so that people can check out those books. Because I Fantastic. remember the first, I will do yeah, that. the first time that I heard you talk, I wrote down what those books were, and and they're they're still available, as far as I recall. Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah. So that would there you go, Christine. More for your library. Yeah, and you know we had talked about that actually because Gary and I had um, previously done. On a, a podcast on reef aquariums. So when the whole reef uh, crochet project came out, when that was actually being built before it was finished, we talked about that pretty extensively. And it was very interesting because a lot of the reason that people got into it was because of the way that crochet can replicate surfaces and, right. and strained surfaces, right. right? In in ways that knitting doesn't, right? Because because crochet does circles really well. Right um, and, and then bend circles. The hyper, well. the hyper, the notion of hyperbolic space is really yes. available with crochet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that was that was really interesting to read from the coral reef part, which is what was sort of drew us in to begin with. But then the idea, you know, I was a crocheter since I was a little little girl, um, and then the idea of uh, of bending uh, flat surfaces because when I was little, you know, that's what grand grandmas just crochet flat things. Um, right. But at the same time. <laughs> We were, you know, amigurumi was starting to come up. Uh, so the idea of crocheting three-dimensional figures was was also, also all of these things were happening at the same time. So the idea of crocheting three-dimensional figures from Japan was coming out. The the mathematical ideas were coming out, and the reef project all kind of coalesced at the same time. Right. There's a there's a in addition to the work at the that's a, uh, there's usually an exhibit at the joint mathematics meetings that are annual. There's also a bridges conference that, that bridges math and art. And a lot of this kind of stuff you're talking about is present at those, those places as well. A lot of fiber art shows up there, surprisingly. That would be really amazing. I think to see it, it well, because it just uh, makes sense when you think right, about it. Right. Right. Hmm. That's really neat. We'll have to figure out where those are. I, yeah, Gary, I can give you links to the Bridges conferences too. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I, I can tell. I'll just sit there and watch, and Christine will go nuts. So <laughs> <laughs> you'd be surprised. There's a lot of intriguing stuff that's very accessible. It's really fun to look at too. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And it, yeah, it, it's really it is really interesting because it also what it does is it um, it makes things uh, tangible, right? So so ideas that were sort of these theoretical things, especially for, for kids, um, but even for adults that are trying to understand things. Once you see the shape, sometimes that, that's the key where, where something sun, sort of clicks and right. you get it, right? Right. So, right? so that moment where you see, okay, well, by adding a single thing in a row causes that shape to bend and that's what creates that difference, that sometimes is the thing that makes all of the math make sense. So, yeah, it, it, to me, it just makes perfect sense. And, and the, the transition from one to the other is pretty seamless. Yeah, it's fun. It's a fun thing to put math together with any sort of creative stitching like that and yeah. see, see where it goes. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm done being nerd. Well, that's quite all right. No, it's, <laughs> I find it, you know, I, I never, like biology and chemistry, I mean, that that's what I did. But I could never, I always fought with math. So when you guys talk about seeing you know, having those visions of how it fits together. That see, I could never get that. 
I never got those visions. Everything was just rote and fight through it and remember the equations and just execute them. And, um, you know, cause I could, and I could tell that there, there would be, there was an, another level where it all just made sense. And then the equations and the math just became secondary and I just never got there. So I'm, I'm actually kind of oh, jealous. That's a, well, that's unfortunate. We'll have to work on that, Gary, the next time we're together. Well, so yeah so okay diane we'll do we'll do that <laughs> so so from a visual perspective though gary so you're you now you have your sewing machine the other place that it comes into play is in garment stitchery right because if you think about a sleeve a sleeve is a flat piece of fabric it's two-dimensional when you have to take that sleeve and you have to sew it into a three-dimensional garment right the top of the sleeve is curved completely but then when you put it into the garment, it's curved in a completely different way. So uh, trust me when I tell you, stitch a couple of sleeves and suddenly all this stuff about two-dimensional things bending into three-dimensional things will start to feel like it makes sense. Because you'll look at the bend of a sleeve and it looks like um, it looks like a standard deviation curve, which is, uh, again, I'm nerding out, right? But it's flat and then it and then it comes up into a bell curve, right? That's exactly what it looks like. Um, and somehow that shape, when you stitch it into something else, makes the shape of a, of the uh, where a sleeve meets the torso of a garment, which when you look at a garment, that would never, you, intuitively, you would never think that that would be so, and yet it is. So if you do that a couple of times and start stitching things that are three-dimensional like that, suddenly you'll start to see the possibilities of how these two-dimensional things can bend into three-dimensional things. And it sort of opens up this whole idea of, of space, right? And, and, and bending things, I guess, which is a terrible way to put it. And I'm sure Diane, you can, you can speak more eloquently about it, but that's to me where it started to sort of make sense also was, was in figuring out what sort of lines you would have to stitch, which made no sense at all. But somehow when you stitch them together, they created a three-dimensional shape. Well, and I think this brings us to a point where I, I think, um, let me get gender specific here for a minute. I think a lot of times people think that girls don't have good spatial sense or don't, because boys do all this Lego playing with, I'm, and I'm stereotyping myself and I'm of a certain age, but often boys will play with Legos and get a sense of three dimensions and stuff by building an architecture. But I think mm -hmm. you're making an excellent point, Christine, in that girls who do some of these sort of domestic things that those of us who are of my age uh, did in the now long gone home economics classes, um, you do have a visual sense of how to take a two dimensional thing and turn it into a three dimensional thing. And it's, it's not to be taken lightly that these things, that's also very hands on. And I think yeah. for, for learners who are trying to do what Gary maybe was uh, complaining about up there a bit where he said, I didn't see it or I couldn't see it or whatever, give you something really tangible to work with. And all of a sudden things become a lot more clear. Yeah, I agree. Once you have your hands on them and you've made it, it feels accessible. And once you've once you've convinced yourself that way that it is accessible, suddenly you can see it. Right. It's it's really about giving yourself permission to to know it because you've already walked into the conversation saying, "I'm not good at math." But once you do this thing and you say, "Oh, I understood that." Now you've given yourself permission to be good at math. I just never thought about a sewing machine as my gateway to mathematical understanding. This is fun. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's this this is you know getting way down the down the path, but it's interesting from my <laughs> perspective because I mean I I am a a person who learns by reading. I mean that's I've always learned by reading. I I, I can listen to people, but I have to read it. And so, but that just has never worked for me with math. And so it, it was just always a battle. I mean, I could get the job done, but it was just always a, just this miserable battle. And then I would see people who like you guys who have the vision, if I, if I can use that and, and just envious because it just would just flow out of them. And for me, it was just a constant fight. So, um, well, let me, let me bring that to a, a comment about teaching 
and learning. And I think I have a lot of experience with teaching and learning. It was my profession before I became a needle artist and a designer um, and a teacher of the needle arts. I, when I was teaching mathematics, I had to learn a lot how to work with students like you, Gary, who really didn't get it just by reading what was on the page and to come up with ways to address um, different kinds of learners, people who learn visually, people who learn by reading. How do you prefer to get your directions from here to the local Dairy Queen? Do you want someone to tell you how to do it? Do you want them to draw you a map? Do you want to see a picture from Google Maps with all of the other buildings on it? Thinking about how, how do you best learn how to do something? And then when I teach needlework or teach mathematics, but now it's much more teaching needlework, how do I address the student who can't just from an instruction book understand how to create a stitch or just from my verbal um, instructions learn how to create a stitch? So, for example, when I teach students how to create a bullion knot on the canvas, and that's a, that's a bugaboo, that's a, that's a stitch that a lot of people have trouble with, and um, you can show them on the page how to do it, and you can draw pictures all you want, but for some people, it really is watching you go through it in the air as a big, you know, hold it up and make a huge dramatic presentation of creating a bullion knot, or standing behind them or them standing behind you while they watch you do that. So I think working with differentiating learning styles is the way to go to get people to appreciate what you're doing and be open to learning that has maybe stymied them in the past because they just haven't gotten it in one way. Yeah. And see, and you know, I'm, I'm a former science teacher and I had no trouble, uh, you know, that, that, to me, that was the fun of it was identifying how students learned and then, right. and then putting together, you know, whether it was visual or hands or, or hearing or, or reading. I mean, I, I didn't have any trouble with that, but it just, for me, for math, it just would never click. Um, it just you know weird, just a weird thing, and 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 a lifelong frustration, because you know I just wonder if if math had come easier, what I would have done science wise, uh, that might have been a different path, you know. And, and well, let me assure you, you're not alone out there. There's there's a, clearly a <laughs> lot of people for whom mathematics has been a stumbling block. Yeah, yeah. Oh well. I'm too old to matter for it to matter much now, anyway. So, <laughs> so you found how do you, your ways around it. Yeah, I'll just stick with words and magazines. I'm fine. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but Diane, how do you how do you get uh, uh, you know to be a math teacher at, at a significant university? How how does the needlework come in? Was that a, a diversion, or how did, how did that work for you? Well, I started stitching like many people. When I was small, I started in brownies. I think my first Girl Scout badge was that embroidery badge that was a little piece of white fabric and a hoop. And I learned to cross stitch on stamped pieces. And all through college, I cross stitched gifts for my friends because that you could go to the local uh, dime store, we'll call it, and pick up floss and and a piece of fabric and do something nice for your friends. It was creative. And um, when I, I just really loved to stitch. I joined uh, EGA. I found a chapter here in Chicago, um, and I really enjoyed learning all the different kinds of things. That's the Embroiders Guild of America, and that's anything with a threaded needle. So my first meeting with this group, we had a ribbon embroidery teacher come in, and I had never done that before. I've been exposed to beading. I've been ex just so many different kinds of things. And we did a mystery project that was a needlepoint project, and I was hooked. I loved <laughs> the variety of stitches that and the different kinds of threads that you could use that I had never seen as a cross stitcher. And so um, through my work with um, EGA and also A&G, the American Needlepoint Guild, I, I really was exposed to lots and lots through their magazines, through their meetings, through their seminars. And I'm a teacher, so I liked to teach things. And I began to think that perhaps when I retired from my math teaching job, I might like to teach needlework. So I chose to do my certification for needlework teaching through the National Academy of Needle Arts. That's NAN. And as I said, it's a three-year program. You get a portfolio of different kinds of pieces, um, beginner pieces, intermediate pieces, lectures. You develop lots of things. That's where that expertise piece came in. And I 
worked on that for the three years of certification. And I, among, among the things you learn are how to do needlework as a business. So I learned how to propose to seminars and how to get uh, business licenses with your state, all the kinds of things you need to learn. So for me, it was a transition from teaching mathematics in a very big academic setting, sort of setting my own business schedule, my own time, my own classes, um, and designing my own pieces. Because if you're going to teach needlework in the way that I want to teach it, what you have to do is you have to create your own designs, write your own instructions, and then convince people that they want to take your classes. So that was a uh, I started my certification in 2007, and I was finished in 2011, and I've been teaching at local seminars and chapters and um, around the country for since then, and I have some teaching to do this coming year, and uh, it's it's really been exciting to travel and meet people and teach this wonderful art form to a group of people who really want to be in your class. You know, when you're teaching math, not everybody wants to be in your class, but, <laughs> but needlework, these people are really excited to be taking a class from you. And it's really, it's refreshing and it's wonderful. Yeah. And, and I don't think we mentioned where, where you taught was the university of Chicago. And if any, anyone is ever in Chicago in Hyde park down South of town and museum of science and industry is there. But if you're a photographer or love architecture, that campus will suck up hours that is it's a gothic beauty. Oh, it's, it's really something. Pretty. Yeah, it is really yeah. something. I've spent many hours down there photographing inside and outside those buildings. And you know, it, every time uh, that I've been there with a group of photographers, you leave and you just have a mental list of, of all the things you want to go back and photograph. It's uh, That's a special campus down there. It really is. It's a, it's a wonderful place, and I had wonderful students, and I'm glad to be doing what I'm doing now with a whole new group of wonderful students yeah. out there in the greater diaspora yeah every every time we hear somebody talk about this this uh, uh nan certification i'm impressed with it because it really does when you complete it you are you are armed and ready to go teach at all levels i i, I just think it's really impressive whoever put that together really thought it through well it's a it's a long standing program and it's we're very active right now. I'm currently the assistant director of teacher education for NAN, and we have candidates who are in process of learning how to teach and be certified, and it is an academy. Unlike EGA and ANG, there aren't local chapters or local guilds. It's really an academy that gets together once a year, and the words they use to describe their activities are a little unusual. So instead of having a seminar each year in March, we gather for an assembly of embroiderers, and we also have these um, certification workshops, both in teaching and in judging. And I am not a needlework judge, but there are a lot of people who do the judging certification program through NAN. And they have, it's an exhibit, but they don't call it an exhibit, they call it an exemplary. And in the exemplary, we do exhibit pieces that people want to have shown and judged. And um, your listeners who have needlework to show might be interested in entering a piece in the exemplary. You don't have to attend. It's a well-judged exhibit. It's a beautiful exhibit. And it's in, it ha takes place in March. I believe the deadline for entry to the exemplary is in mid-February. So it's not too late to enter this year. And if you're in the vicinity of Troy, Michigan, it's a suburb of Detroit. Well, it, I won't know if it's a suburb. It's outside of Detroit. Um, we'll be there in March having our certification uh, workshops for judges and teachers, at, followed by an assembly with classes, national teachers to come to teach the same kind of classes you would find at our national seminars for ANG or EGA. Is that, a, my, my sister lives not too far from there, so free housing for me, but is that an event where if I went, I would get a lot out of it, even if I didn't take a class? Well, the focus really is on the classes. There is the exemplary to go and visit. There, so the workshops for teachers and judges happen before the assembly. The assembly is two and four day classes by teachers. There's a actually there's a five day Japanese embroidery component to this as well. Ooh. And Shay Pendre <laughs> runs a well, she runs a ballroom full of Japanese embroiderers through their paces for five days. Oh, that's so tough stuff. A, there, that's that's it is, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it is a really wonderful opportunity to learn and grow in your needle art work. Yeah, we had a lady come to the Fox chapter and show us Japanese embroidery. I, I, I probably should have picked up my jaw two or three times. Uh, that's, <laughs> that is absolutely amazing stuff, and it takes years to master it. Right. It is exquisite work. It is exquisite, exquisite, beautiful work. Yeah. So precise. Oh, so precise. Yeah, it really, it really appeals to me that, <laughs> that quest for perfection part of me. It really, right. Um, oh yeah. That, that lady, I'll tell you, I just kind of stood there in awe of her. She was something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so let's do before we, oh yeah. Before we run out of time, let's talk about some of your designs. Cause I think, I think some of your stuff is just just amazing. Now, uh, uh, just about anybody who's been around Needlepoint very long knows walking the water's edge. And, right. Uh, yeah, and, and there's a math, so that, math component to that, which I, I found really interesting. Right, so that's a, it's a very popular design. It uses single thread uh, blending, single strand thread blending to create the blues of an ocean wave crashing on the beach. And there's an open work, pulled work uh, sort of border that makes the foam. And there's, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a Bargello pattern, a Florentine mm -hmm. pattern that makes the wave work. But the actual edge of the wave, to create the edge of the wave and therefore create the rhythm of the Bargello as you change colors is an actual wave equation. So, um, I frankly, I looked around on the internet until I found a wave equation that was interesting enough to make it worth my while to put it on a piece of canvas. <laughs> and um, once you stitch that first line of the wave, the, the thread blending just sort of takes over. It's a fairly um, comfortable stitch for most people. It's very accessible to beginning needle pointers. In fact, I've I've taught it at a couple of cross-stitch retreats where the organizers were brave enough to have a needle pointer come and start with people who did cross-stitch. So people who are accustomed to working on a grid, just different grid kind of thinking from the way needle pointers do about it, and making that uh, transition from a gridded cross-stitch pattern to a needle point pattern, from working in a hoop or on stretcher bars, or on a hoop or a, a scroll frame to stretcher bars and using a laying tool and doing some of the things that canvas stitchers uh, use in their, in their, <laughs> that quest for perfection Gary talked about. <laughs> and um, it's a, it's a very pretty piece. Um, and I think interestingly how it got out there is that I entered it in the math an art exhibit at our joint meetings, those math meetings I was talking about before. And in it didn't win a prize in the competition and in the art exhibit at the math meetings, but it did get chosen to be the August calendar picture on the every year they do a math calendar with the art from this exhibit. And then it got up on the internet and it got on Pinterest and it kind of grew from there. And it's it's got a life of its own. It has its own Facebook page, in fact, <laughs> for pe for people who've taken the class. So it's it's quite it's been quite a popular piece. And it is the second piece I ever designed. It's the I designed it for Nan in the certification program, and it's one of those I I I hoped it wouldn't be a one hit wonder, <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's been very very popular, and it's very satisfying to teach it. I still love to teach it. It doesn't get old for me to watch how people respond to it as they find it coming to life on their canvas. Now, see, I'm glad to hear that because, you know, you hear about uh, uh, songwriters, musicians who have a signature song and the audience wants to hear it in every concert. And, you know, after 15 years, if I do that song one more time, I'm just going to shoot myself, you know. And and so I wondered if if you really got tired of it after a while, but obviously not. So that's that's neat. No, I really no, I don't. I still love to teach. I just love to teach that piece. Yeah, and then you did a companion piece. I'd forgotten till you sent pictures that uh, talks about basically talks about the junk in the ocean there. Okay, so this is a, the people who've taken my walking the water's edge class know that recently I have I have started to rail against straws, and I won't take podcast time up, but people should not use straws much. Plastic straws are bad. You can ask me later about that. But so this year, um, EGA every year sponsors a challenge and with a theme, and um, I 
I entered a, a piece in the challenge and I chose to participate in that. It was kind of breaking new ground, figure out a new way to use your embroidery on a different ground. And so this is a piece I designed that uses the same curve of the wave. On I stitched on perforated paper. I stitched the wave bits with strips of blue plastic bags that I had cut up and threaded into a needle. Uh, you'd be surprised that the Sunday paper blue plastic sleeve is different from the weekday paper blue plastic sleeve. In its oh, color. No. <laughs> so I was able to find, and people are now giving me plastic bags of all kinds of colors, but I stitched the wave with plastic. I used a dental floss to stitch the foam, which is usually done in pearl cotton on my original piece. And then up on the shore, I stitched debris. Um, I, I took a trip with my husband to Hawaii and we did a beach cleanup and the amount of plastic uh, that we picked up in a morning was overwhelming and very sad. And so I tried to make the beach and the components on the beach out of things that were really stitched. So I, I took um, jump rings and uh, stitched around them <clears throat> and put them together to make a six pack ring. And that's under the bullion, not starfish on this piece. That's called refuse the straw. The one that's, the one that's on perforated paper with the plastic. I, I took a washer and wrapped it. I did a, a blanket stitch around it with pearl cotton to make a tire up on the beach. Um, so I have, I have various items and things. I'm, I will probably be exhibiting that both at NAN in the exemplary and in the, uh, in the, EGA education exhibit this year as a part of the challenge thing. But yeah, I did do a companion piece about that. I really have become much more aware of the ocean and straws and plastics since I started teaching that piece. I've been more cognizant of it. And I think this piece expresses how it's the same size. It's an eight by eight piece. It's the same size as the original. So when they're side by side here in the house, it's really kind of striking to see the beauty of the the wave that's just the floss and then the really the disturbing sight of the wave where everything is messed up on the beach. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know that appeals to me and Christine and I, and our now, now former uh, mm -hmm. reef aquarium hobbies, we, you know, we were very sensitive to the damage we're doing to the oceans and to reefs and that the environment is, and you know, the, the animals, the beautiful animals that are dying with reef bleaching and all the junk in the ocean that's just ruining really a vast beautiful landscape and uh, uh that that really speaks loudly to that very problem it's uh yeah so i'm i'm glad i put the piece together you know what else i like about it too is usually when you have those conversations you have the conversation for five minutes and then you go on your day this if you're stitching this piece it forces you to think about it for all the hours that you spend stitching that piece so how many hours is it you know 40 hours more so it's for 40 lot. hours, yes. you're, you're right. sitting there thinking about exactly this, right? So you're, you're talking about it as being a very sad thing. And so that entire thing, you're, you're really motivated. We talk about uh, re reproduction samplers and how you spend that time thinking about the girls that had stitched them. Here, you're forcing someone to spend their time thinking about pollution, which right. sounds terrible, but it's it's exactly the right way, especially when they're feeling the texture of these things in their hand. It, it forms such a, a strong sensory memory. And right. then well, every time they see the piece, they'll have that same memory and hopefully it will push people to do things that will, you know, benefit. Mindfulness. It's about mindfulness. Yes, correct. Right. Exactly. Right. That's a very right. much more eloquent way of putting it. Mm. I, I like that. I didn't realize until uh, again until you sent some of the pictures, and I was looking on your website. The, your the Mayan influence in some of your designs is that just uh, traveled there and became fascinated with that culture, or how how does that come well, about? Well, now that's that's a really it, it's lovely you're asking. So it, I have not, in fact, traveled to Guatemala, but I have a very strong connection. Um, we have a family in our church that came in sanctuary in the '80s during the Civil War and brought. Guatemalan culture to the forefront in a big part of my life. And I've been drawn to the idea of trying to honor the women who do the backstrap loom weaving in that culture. And well, in fact, backstrap 
loom weaving is done all over the world, but I'm particularly, uh, I have a lot of samples from Guatemala. A lot of my friends, my husband has gone a lot of times. And so I have lots of samples of Guatemalan uh, fabric and textiles. I have a lecture that I do on Guatemalan fabric and textiles. And I, I really appreciate the, I've learned about the symbolism that's in their weavings and the colors that are used and how those evoke, um, I think, an international cultural, uh, something that's really important to lots and lots of people. And the way you can convey that to people here who don't see those kinds of things all the time through needlework is really, it's been an eye opener for me. And it's been a gateway for me to be able to express my um, admiration for and love of those patterns and the skill that mostly women who are doing the backstrap weaving have put into everyday garments and textiles. And I don't know that we appreciate that as much. So I try to make some of my designs, the Mayan connection is, is through that. Does that make sense, Gary? Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, that backstrap weaving, that's a fascinating skill actually necessity for them but a skill and uh, fun to, fun to watch that done and plus the colors you get to use uh, right well and and in that uh, I have a piece called my enlightening that's really quite striking it's lots of blacks lots of bright colors and I use rayon threads and it's a I think it can be a scary challenging piece for some needle workers to attempt but it's it's also a way for me to allow uh people to try those kinds of new things that they might be afraid to try on their own, but in a class where they're being guided, it can be a good thing to do. And the, the Quetzalcoatl piece, the, um, that's a, that's a newer piece and it's got a, it's got this snaky looking thing on it. Okay. Uh, I got I got to stop. I got to stop you there. Say that word again. Cause I, I wanted to Quet know how to pronounce that. It starts with a Q it's Quetzalcoatl. And okay. it's a bird. It's a fe it's a feathered serpent in Mayan mythology. Well, it's in in Central American mythology, Mexican. You'll see that bird. And uh, the piece I have is meant to portray the blouse front of some weaving that a woman would do. And it's I actually have as an inspiration for it an antique weep heel that I've seen pictures of. I don't have, but I've seen pictures of. And that piece has the colors and the weavings of and different patterns from Guatemalan pieces that I have in my own collection. But I did the piece. It's a Florentine piece. It's exclusively Bargello, that piece. There's no curves in it, so to speak. It's just all vertical stitches. And it was done as a part of EGA's Master Craftsman program. I'm working towards Master Craftsman at Canvas. It's a six-step program you do, and you create um, – pieces according to certain guidelines and then they're judged and you work towards becoming a master craftsman there's six steps and I've done five and that that Quetzalcoatl piece was the piece that I did and submitted for the Florentine part of that journey and the, the piece that there's another piece that's in that same journey for me and that's the Diamond City Lights this, the Chicago Skyline piece that's a piece I designed also for the master craftsman program and that's well, that was for the step that required you to do diaper patterns, which are patterns that create visual diagonals in, in more than one direction. So both of those pieces came out of my work through the EGA Master Craftsman Program. When, when you work on these certifications, basically does all your, all your other stitching just get set aside? You, it, all your stitching has to be focused on these things? They, I oh, mean, that that would make me crazy, Gary. I couldn't well, do that. That's so, what I wondered. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. in fact, I'm very concentrated when I'm working on these challenge pieces or when I'm designing a new piece. I'm very, very, very focused on that. But I told you I was a cross-stitcher from way back, and I still have cross-stitched pieces, and I have black work pieces and other kinds of things that I pull out and have in my stash. Like every other needleworker, I think, I have – eight, 10 projects going at one time and they're all in a bag. And when I'm working on these very, um, very demanding pieces or newly creative pieces, I can't sustain the energy on them for a long, long time. So at night when I'm sitting and watching TV or watching a movie or listening to a podcast, I'll have something else that's a little less demanding in my hands. 
Yeah, that that Diamond City Lights. You, you, I don't know that I've seen a picture yet that does that justice. When you when you see that thing, the real thing, it is the depth you've put into that thing is uh, I, I think just remarkable. It really is a, an amazing thing. Well, it's a fun piece. I can't wait to I can't wait to teach it. That's coming up soon. Oh, is it? Okay, good, good. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. And then. You just posted the other day, Herald Angel. Right. So you're going to hear the word challenge from me again. So um, Nan, in the exemplary, every other year issues a challenge. And sometimes it's a word and sometimes it's a technique and sometimes it's, well, so they one year the Nan challenge was hats. Stitch anything with a hat. And you stitch and you enter into the challenge category anything that you've stitched with a hat theme and they're judged and their ribbons given so this year's challenge for nan is the word angel and so it was she just the person who put the charge out said just stitch an angel any interpret it any way you want and i found a, a guatemalan uh, angel figurine uh, that i liked and I interpreted her in needlepoint. And I, so I made the figure on the canvas. I stitched her. Um, she's got one wing up and one wing down, and she's got a trumpet trumpeting up into the air, and her head is tilted back. And I was stitching a Bargello pattern for the background in a kind of a peachy, neutral, corally, very light coral. And uh, it got to a point when it was the holiday season, and we were singing all these songs about the angels. And they break the sky apart with light that that those words came across to me and i decided i would stop stitching that background in a peachy color and add the night and so what what this herald angel has and she's brand new i've just finished her is there's the figure the guatemalan figure interpreted in needlepoint and then she's got this partially filled bargello light sky behind her and then the dark sky is above and below her so that's kind of where she came from. It was just this challenge word angel from Nan. I tend to like focusing on challenges that give me a little bit of limitation. I'm, uh, you were afraid of math, Gary, a little bit. I'm afraid of the blank page as a designer. Mm -hmm. I can get really intimidated. But just give me a little bit of, a little bit of guide. Only do Florentine stitches. Only stitch an angel only stitch uh, on a different kind of a ground. And then I'm kind of a little freer with, I have somewhere to start. The blank page really freaks me out. But a little bit of, of guidance with a word or a thought or a technique, that can help me. So that's where the Herald Angel came from. Hmm. That's neat. And then, and then tied into a, a, a verse from a, from a song. Right. Break, breaking the yeah. sky. But then, then, yeah, then you went to that Guatemalan uh, influence again. Yeah. Right. Well, I tend, I tend to like that kind of art, and it's where I look when I'm, when I'm, uh, I have a lot, we have a lot of Guatemalan books around the house and travel things, and when I'm looking for inspiration for stitching and making designs, I really do what a lot of, I think, I think a lot of artists do, and that is to go through my magazines, go through my books, go through um, Google Images for, for all that matter, and just look for things that intrigue me or take photographs and see what inspires. And that's kind of the jumping off place. So, yeah, you take inspiration wherever you can find it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so you're, you're one of those that walks around and, and looking at things and seeing mentally how, how would I interpret that uh, with needle and thread then? That's exactly right. We just had a great ice storm down here in my part of the world in Hyde Park. I live near the Lake Michigan shore and we had big waves on Friday night and then it froze like crazy. And over at the the local lake shore where I live, there have the ice has frozen on the trees and the branches and made ice caves and I have taken way too many pictures of trees covered with <laughs> ice and the, te the texture of the ice that's frozen on the light pole and the texture of the ice that's frozen on the tree bark and how that's different. And yeah, I think that's exactly what I do, Gary. It's really fun. To and I do think as I take those pictures, as I look at things, how would I stitch this? How would I, what fiber would I use? What, what 
ground would I use? Do I want to get three dimensional? What stitch would make that curve look exactly the right way? So yeah, it's it's a lot of how I think when I'm out there observing the world. Do you yeah. think that your teaching um, training uh, that you've done so far has contributed to your ability to, to do that? Well, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I don't. Teaching for me and the creative part of designing seem to me to be different places in my brain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, they're very different. I think the designing part, the creative part, is well, maybe it's maybe it's not quite different. It's I think the creative designing part is something that is more spontaneous and the teaching part is much more planned. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it does. I, I, I think that right now for me, the creative part has to come first and then the, the teaching designing part follows uh, or the teaching and the writing up, writing up instructions and figuring out how to communicate that, that follows afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if, the, so once you've been doing this for a while, if it becomes easier or if you find yourself um, looking at things differently. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So in, in my line of work, I do cosmetics and we do color a lot. So at the beginning, color and fragrance to me, both, they work the same. Um, they're all just kind of there, right? You, you see them, you smell them, but you just, you don't really pay much attention to them until you have to. And then you start sort of teasing out the, the nuances of, well, this is black, but it's not really black. It's really okay. I see what, right. Purple. I see what you mean. Right. Right. And, and so now, when I walk around and I see black, I don't really see black. I see that's black, but it's really dark green. And this fragrance really is is very lemony. And it, you sort of your perception changes because you've trained your brain a little bit right. to tease out little elements of this. And I'm wondering if it works the same. Like my, visual things. my observation uh, skills are much sharper now. And I see things and I'll point things out to people and I'll say, did you see this? And they'll say, I never thought of it that way. And mm -hmm. part of it does mm -hmm. come, uh, I think also part of it comes from my background in math and geometry and noticing pattern. I'm very, very quick and very, I'm always on the lookout for pattern and what what I see in it and how it makes a pattern and how it's different from a pattern I've seen before. And that kind of, that kind of visual perception and, and knowledge of it and um, awareness of it has just, it's become sharper, I think. And I think that's encouraging though, because it means that you can learn this, you know, there's, there's this idea and we've talked about it. And I, I think a lot of people feel this way that, um, designing or being creative or doing anything off book. Um, well, you know, I can't do that because I'm not an artist, but to hear somebody who has done that, who has gone from a stitcher to a designer and talk about the evolution of that process. Um, and, and to say that, yes, you do get better at it. You start seeing things differently. Um, well, the idea that you can train yourself to do that to a degree is encouraging to people to try to do it. Right. And I think you, you, everybody has a unique point of view mm, and that's, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's important to believe that you don't have to be, I mean, imagine your favorite, your, your icon of a designer in whatever field you're in here, whether you're in sampler work or whether you're in needlepoint or whether you're in cool work, you don't have to be that person. You have to, you have, if you're going to design something, it just needs to be your voice because your voice will be unique out there. I was very intimidated as I started the NAND certification program because most people, it seems to me, come to this this new profession I'm in from a, a stronger design and color theory kind of, I had to really work to learn that stuff. And it's, I'm still learning it. And I'm taking advantage every time I can take a class in color or design, I still do that because I think it's a really important thing to do. But it is knowing that your voice is a unique way of putting out what you're you have to put out there and that that can help give you some confidence i think that's an important message that everyone's voice has a space right i think it's excellent all right i think we're going to call it right there that's this has been fun diane thanks so much oh it has been such a pleasure to talk to you both yeah 
Well, we've enjoyed it too. Well. Yeah, what a treat. Uh, thanks, and um, uh, I, I like I love hearing what goes behind these designs. And uh, now I'll, I'll have a different view of Harold Angel here coming as I look at mm -hmm. it next time. That's very good. Oh, well, that's good. Thanks yep. a lot. It's been really a wonderful experience talking with you too, and I love your podcast. Keep up the good work. We'll Thank do that. You so Thank much. you. All right. Thanks okay. to everybody for listening, and Christine and I will be back on Wednesday.